Cosmic Memory, the story of Atlantis, Lemuria, and the division of the sexes, by Rudolf Steiner. 1. Contemporary Civilization in the Mirror of the Science of the Spirit, 1904. The observer of the course of scientific development in the last decades cannot doubt that a great revolution is in preparation. Today, when a scientist talks about the so-called enigmas of existence, it sounds quite different than it did a short time ago. Around the middle of the 19th century, some of the most daring spirits saw in scientific materialism the only creed possible to one familiar with the then recent results of research. The blunt saying of that time has become famous. Thoughts stand in about the same relationship to the brain as gall to the liver. This was stated by Karl Vogt, who in his Köhler Glauben und Wissenschaft, Blind Faith and Science, and in other writings, declared everything to be superannuated which did not make spiritual activity and the life of the soul proceed from the mechanism of the nervous system and of the brain in the same manner in which physicists explain that the movement of the hands proceeds from the mechanism of the clock. That was the time when Ludwig Büchner's Kraft und Stoff, Force and Matter, became a sort of gospel among wide circles of the educated. One may well say that excellent, independently thinking minds came to such convictions because of the powerful impression made by the successes of science in those times. A short time before, the microscope had shown the synthesis of living beings out of their smallest parts, the cells. Geology, the science of the formation of the earth, had come to the point of explaining the development of the planets in terms of the same laws that still operate today. Darwinism promised to explain the origin of man in a completely natural way and began its victorious course through the educated world so auspiciously that for many it seemed to dispose of all old belief. A short time ago, all this became quite different. It is true that stragglers who adhere to these opinions can still be found in men like Ladenburg at the Congress of Scientists in 1903, who proclaim the materialistic gospel, but against them stand others who have arrived at a quite different way of speaking through more mature reflection on scientific questions. A work has just appeared that bears the title Naturwissenschaft und Weltanschauung, Science and World Conception. Its author is Max Fervon, a physiologist of the school of Haeckel. In this work, one can read the following. Indeed, even if we possess the most complete knowledge of the physiological events in the cells and fibers of the cerebral cortex with which psychic events are connected, even if we could look into the mechanism of the brain as we look into the works of a clock, we would never find anything but moving atoms. No human being could see or otherwise perceive through his senses how sensations and ideas arise in this mechanism. The results which the materialistic conception has obtained in its attempt to trace mental processes back to the movements of atoms illustrates its efficiency very clearly. As long as the materialistic conception has existed, it has not explained the simplest sensation by movements of atoms. Thus it has been, and thus it will be in future. How could it be conceivable that things which are not perceptible by the senses, such as the psychic processes, could ever be explained by a mere splitting up of large bodies into their smallest parts? The atom is still a body after all, and no movement of atoms is ever capable of bridging the gulf between the material world and the psyche. However fruitful the materialistic point of view has been as a scientific working hypothesis, however fruitful it will doubtless remain in this sense in the future, I point only to the successes of structural chemistry, just as useless is it as the basis for a world conception. Here it shows itself to be too narrow. Philosophical materialism has finished playing its historical role. This attempt at a scientific world conception has failed forever. 
Thus, at the beginning of the 20th century, a scientist speaks about the conception that around the middle of the 19th was proclaimed as a new gospel demanded by the advances of science. It is especially the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s of the 19th century which may be designated as the years of the high tide of materialism. The explanation of mental and spiritual phenomena on the basis of purely mechanical processes exercised a really fascinating influence at that time. The materialists could tell themselves that they had won a victory over the adherence of a spiritual world conception. Those also who had not started from scientific studies joined their ranks. While Buchner, Vogt, Moleschott, and others still built on purely scientific premises in his Alten und Neuen Glauben, Old and New Belief, 1872, David Friedrich Strauss attempted to obtain bases for the new creed from his theological and philosophical ideas. Decades before, he had already intervened in the intellectual life with his Leben Jesu, Life of Jesus, in a manner that caused a sensation. He seemed to be equipped with the full theological and philosophical culture of his time. He now said boldly, that the materialistic explanation of the phenomena of the universe, including man, had to form the basis for a new gospel, for a new moral comprehension and formation of existence. The descent of man from purely animal ancestors seemed about to become a new dogma, and in the eyes of scientific philosophers, all adherence to spiritual soul origin of our race amounted to an antiquated superstition from the infancy of mankind, with which one did not have to disturb oneself further. The historians of culture came to the aid of those who built on the new science. The customs and ideas of savage tribes were made the object of study. The remains of primitive cultures, which are dug out of the ground like the bones of prehistoric animals, and the impressions of extinct plants were to bear witness to the fact that at his first appearance on earth, man was distinguished only in degree from the higher animals, and that mentally and spiritually he had risen to his present eminence from the level of animalism pure and simple. A time had come when everything in this materialistic edifice seemed to be right. Under a kind of coercion that the ideas of the time exercised on them, men thought as a faithful materialist has written, the assiduous study of science has brought me to the point where I accept everything calmly, bear the inevitable patiently, and for the rest help in the work of gradually reducing the misery of mankind. The fantastic consolations which a credulous mind seeks in marvelous formulas I can renounce all the more easily, since my imagination receives the most beautiful stimulation through literature and art. When I follow the plot of a great drama, or, under the guidance of scientists, make a journey to other stars, an excursion through prehistoric landscapes, when I admire the majesty of nature on mountain peaks, or venerate the art of man in tones and colors, do I not then have enough of the elevating? Do I then still need something which contradicts my reason? The fear of death, which torments so many of the pious, is completely unknown to me. I know that I no more survive after my body decays than I lived before my birth. The agonies of purgatory and of hell do not exist for me. I return to the boundless realm of nature, who embraces all her children lovingly. My life was not in vain. I have made good use of the strength which I possessed. I depart from earth in the firm belief that everything will become better and more beautiful. From Glauben zum Wissen ein lehrreicher Entwicklungsgang getreu nach dem Leben geschildert von Kuno Freidank, on the belief in knowledge, an instructive course of development described in a manner faithfully true to life by Kuno Freidank. Many people who are still subject to the compulsive ideas that acted upon the representatives of the materialistic world conception in the time mentioned above also think in this manner today. Those, however, who try to maintain themselves on the heights of scientific thought have come to other ideas. 
the first reply to scientific materialism made by an eminent scientist at the Congress of Scientists in Leipzig, 1876, has become famous. Dubois Raymond at that time made his ignorabimus speech. He tried to demonstrate that this scientific materialism could in fact do nothing but ascertain the movements of the smallest material particles, and he demanded that it should be satisfied with doing this. But he emphasized at the same time that in doing this it contributes absolutely nothing to an explanation of mental and spiritual processes. One may take whatever attitude one pleases toward these statements of Dubois Raymond, but this much is clear, they represented a rejection of the materialistic interpretation of the world. They showed how as a scientist one could lose confidence in this interpretation. The materialistic interpretation of the world had thereby entered the stage where it declared itself to be unassuming as far as the life of the soul is concerned. It admitted its ignorance, agnosticism. It is true that it declared its intention of remaining scientific and of not having recourse to other sources of knowledge, but on the other hand it did not want to ascend with its means to a higher world conception. This is an undertaking to which we would like to refer again on another occasion. The facts now steadily increased that showed the impossibility of the attempt to build up a science of the soul on the investigation of material phenomena. Science was forced to study certain abnormal phenomena of the life of the soul, like hypnotism, suggestion, somnambulism. It became apparent that in the face of these phenomena, a materialistic view is completely inadequate for a truly thinking person. The facts with which one became acquainted were not new. They were phenomena which had already been studied in earlier times and up to the beginning of the 19th century, but which in the time of the materialistic flood had simply been put aside as inconvenient. To this was added something else. It became more and more apparent on how weak a basis the scientists had built, even as far as their explanations of the origin of animal species and consequently of man were concerned. For a while the ideas of adaptation and of the struggle for existence had exercised an attraction in the explanation of the origin of species. One learned to understand that in following them one had followed mirages. A school was formed under the leadership of Weissmann, which denied that characteristics which an organism had acquired through adaptation to the environment could be transmitted by inheritance, and that in this way a transformation of organisms could occur. One therefore ascribed everything to the struggle for existence, and spoke of an omnipotence of natural selection. A stark contrast to this view was presented by those who, relying on unquestionable facts, declared that a struggle for existence had been spoken of in cases where it did not even exist. They wanted to demonstrate that nothing could be explained by it. They spoke of an impotence of natural selection. Moreover, in the last years, de Vries was able to show experimentally that changes of one lifetime into another can occur by leaps, mutation. With this, what was regarded as a firm article of faith by the Darwinists, namely that animal and plant forms change only gradually, was shaken. More and more, the ground on which one had built for decades simply disappeared beneath one's feet. Even earlier, thinking scientists had realized that they had to abandon this ground. Thus W. H. Rolfe, who died young, in 1884 declared in his book, Biologische Probleme, zugleich als Versuch zur Entwicklung einer rationellen Ethik, biological problems with an attempt at the development of rational ethics. Only through the introduction of insatiability does the Darwinian principle of the struggle for life become acceptable, because it is only then that we have an explanation for the fact that wherever it can, a creature acquires more than it needs for maintaining the status quo that it grows to excess where the occasion for this is given, while for the Darwinists there is no struggle for existence wherever the existence of a creature is not threatened. For me the struggle is an omnipresent one. 
It is primarily a struggle for life, a struggle for the increase of life, not a struggle for existence. It is only natural that in view of these facts, the judicious confess to themselves, the materialistic universe of thought is not fit for the construction of a world conception. If we base ourselves on it, we cannot say anything about mental and spiritual phenomena. Today, there are already numerous scientists who seek to erect a structure of the world for themselves, based on quite different ideas. One need only recall the work of the botanist, Reinke, Die Welt als Tat, The World as Deed. However, it becomes apparent that such scientists have not been trained with impunity amidst purely materialistic ideas. What they utter from their new idealistic standpoint is inadequate, can satisfy them for a while, but not those who look more deeply into the enigmas of the world. Such scientists cannot bring themselves to approach those methods that proceed from a real contemplation of the mind and the soul. They have the greatest fear of mysticism, of gnosis, or theosophy. This appears clearly, for example, in the work of Fervorn, quoted above. He says, There is a ferment in science. Things which seemed clear and transparent to everybody have become cloudy today. Long-tested symbols and ideas with which everyone dealt and worked at every step without hesitation a short time ago have begun to totter and are looked upon with suspicion. Fundamental concepts, such as those of matter, appear to have been shaken, and the firmest ground is beginning to sway under the scientist's steps. Certain problems alone stand with rock-like firmness, problems on which until now all attempts, all efforts of science have been shattered. In the face of this knowledge, one who is despondent resignedly throws himself into the arms of mysticism, which has always been the last refuge when the tormented intellect could see no way out. The sensible man looks for new symbols and attempts to create new bases on which he can build further. One can see that because of his habits of conceptualization, the scientific thinker of today is not in a position to think of mysticism otherwise than as implying intellectual confusion and vagueness. What concepts of the life of the soul does such a thinker not reach? At the end of the work referred to above we read, Prehistoric man formed the idea of a separation of body and soul in face of death. The soul separated itself from the body and led an independent existence. It found no rest and returned as a ghost unless it was banned by sepulchral ceremonies. Man was terrorized by fear and superstition. The remains of these ideas have come down to our time. The fear of death, that is, of what is to come after, is widespread today. How differently does all this appear from the standpoint of psychomonism? Since the psychic experiences of the individual only take place when certain regular connections exist, they cease when these connections are in any way disturbed, as happens numberless times in the course of a day. With the bodily changes at death, these connections stop entirely. Thus no sensation and conception, no thought and no feeling of the individual can remain. The individual soul is dead. Nevertheless, the sensations and thoughts and feelings continue to live. They live beyond the transitory individual in other individuals, wherever the same complexes of conditions exist. They are transmitted from individual to individual, from generation to generation, from people to people. They weave at the eternal loom of the soul. They work at the history of the human spirit. Thus we all survive after death as links in the great interconnected chain of spiritual development. But is that something different from the survival of the wave in others that it has caused, itself meanwhile disappearing? Does one really survive when one continues to exist only in one's effects? Does one not have such a survival in common with all phenomena, even those of physical nature? One can see that the materialistic world conception 
had to undermine its own foundations, as yet it cannot lay new ones. Only a true understanding of mysticism, theosophy, and gnosis will enable it to do so. The chemist, Osterwald, spoke several years ago at the Congress of Scientists at Lübeck of the overcoming of materialism, and for this purpose founded a new periodical dealing with the philosophy of nature. Science is ready to receive the fruits of a higher world conception. All resistance will avail it nothing. It will have to take into account the needs of the longing human soul. 2. From the Akasha Chronicle Preface By means of ordinary history, man can learn only a small part of what humanity experienced in prehistory. Historical documents shed light on but a few millennia. What archaeology, paleontology, and geology can teach us is very limited. Furthermore, everything built on external evidence is unreliable. One need only consider how the picture of an event or people not so very remote from us has changed when new historical evidence has been discovered. One need but compare the descriptions of one and the same thing as given by different historians, and he will soon realize on what uncertain ground he stands in these matters. Everything belonging to the external world of the senses is subject to time. In addition, time destroys what has originated in time. On the other hand, external history is dependent on what has been preserved in time. Nobody can say that the essential has been preserved if he remains content with external evidence. Everything that comes into being in time has its origin in the eternal. But the eternal is not accessible to sensory perception. Nevertheless, the ways to the perception of the eternal are open for man. He can develop forces dormant in him so that he can recognize the eternal. In the essays, Wie erlangt man Erkenntnisse der höheren Welten? How does one attain knowledge of higher worlds, which appear in this periodical? This development is referred to. These present essays will also show that at a certain high level of his cognitive power, Man can penetrate to the eternal origins of the things which vanish with time. A man broadens his powers of cognition in this way if he is no longer limited to external evidence where knowledge of the past is concerned. Then he can see in events what is not perceptible to the senses, that part which time cannot destroy. He penetrates from transitory to non-transitory history. It is a fact that this history is written in other characters than is ordinary history. In Gnosis and in Theosophy, it is called the Akasha Chronicle. Only a faint conception of this chronicle can be given in our language, for our language corresponds to the world of the senses. That which is described by our language at once receives the character of this sense world. To the uninitiated, who cannot yet convince himself of the reality of a separate spiritual world through his own experiences, the initiate easily appears to be a visionary, if not something worse. The one who has acquired the ability to perceive in the spiritual world comes to know past events in their eternal character. The events do not stand before him like the dead testimony of history, but appear in full life. In a certain sense, what has happened takes place before him. Those initiated into the reading of such a living script can look back into a much more remote past than is represented by external history, and, on the basis of direct spiritual perception, they can also describe much more dependably the things of which history tells. In order to avoid possible misunderstanding, it should be said that spiritual perception is not infallible. This perception also can err, can see in an inexact, oblique, wrong manner. No man is free from error in this field, no matter how high he stands. Therefore, one should not object when communications emanating from such spiritual sources do not always entirely correspond. But the dependability of observation is much greater here than in the external world of the senses. 
what various initiates can relate about history and prehistory will be in essential agreement. Such a history and prehistory does in fact exist in all mystery schools. Here for millennia, the agreement has been so complete that the conformity existing among external historians of even a single century cannot be compared with it. The initiates describe essentially the same things at all times and in all places. Following this introduction, several chapters from the Akasha Chronicle will be given. First, those events will be described which took place when the so-called Atlantean continent still existed between America and Europe. This part of our Earth's surface was once land. Today this forms the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Plato tells of the last remnant of this land, the island Poseidon, which lay westward of Europe and Africa. In the story of Atlantis and Lost Lemuria by W. Scott Elliott, the reader can find that the floor of the Atlantic Ocean was once a continent, that for about a million years it was the scene of a civilization which, to be sure, was quite different from our modern ones, and the fact that the last remnants of this continent sank in the 10th millennium B.C. In this present book, the intention is to give information that will supplement what is said by Scott Elliott. While he describes more the outer, the external events among our Atlantean ancestors, the aim here is to record some details concerning their spiritual character and the inner nature of the conditions under which they live. Therefore, the reader must go back in imagination to a period which lies almost 10,000 years behind us and which lasted for many millennia. What is described here, however, did not take place only on the continent now covered by the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, but also in the neighboring regions of what today is Asia, Africa, Europe, and America. What took place in these regions later developed from this earlier civilization. Today, I am still obliged to remain silent about the sources of the information given here. One who knows anything at all about such sources will understand why this has to be so. But events can occur that will make a breaking of this silence possible very soon. How much of the knowledge hidden within the theosophical movement may gradually be communicated depends entirely on the attitude of our contemporaries. Now follows the first of the writings that can be given here. 3. Our Atlantean Ancestors Our Atlantean ancestors differed more from present-day man than he would imagine whose knowledge is confined wholly to the world of the senses. This difference extended not only to the external appearance but also to spiritual faculties, their knowledge, their technical arts, indeed their entire civilization differed from what can be observed today. If we go back to the first periods of Atlantean humanity, we find a mental capacity quite different from ours. Logical reason, the power of arithmetical combining, on which everything rests that is produced today, were totally absent among the first Atlanteans. On the other hand, they had a highly developed memory. This memory was one of their most prominent mental faculties. For example, the Atlantean did not calculate as we do by learning certain rules which he then applied. A multiplication table was something totally unknown in Atlantean times. Nobody impressed upon his intellect that three times four is twelve. In the event that he had to perform such a calculation, he could manage because he remembered identical or similar situations. He remembered how it had been on previous occasions. One need only realize that each time a new faculty develops in an organism, an old faculty loses power and acuteness. The man of today is superior to the Atlantean in logical reasoning, in the ability to combine. On the other hand, memory has deteriorated, Nowadays, man thinks in concepts, the Atlantean thought in images. When an image appeared in his soul, he remembered a great many similar images which he had already experienced. He directed his judgment accordingly. 
For this reason, all teaching at that time was different from what it became later. It was not calculated to furnish the child with rules, to sharpen his reason. Instead, life was presented to him in vivid images, so that later he could remember as much as possible when he had to act under particular conditions. When the child had grown and had gone out into life, for everything he had to do he could remember something similar which had been presented to him in the course of his education. He could manage best when the new situation was similar to one he had already seen. Under totally new conditions, the Atlantean had to rely on experiment, while in this respect much has been spared modern man due to the fact that he is equipped with rules. He can easily apply these in those situations that are new to him. The Atlantean system of education gave a uniformity to all of life. For long periods, things were done again and again in the same way. The faithful memory did not allow anything to develop that was even remotely similar to the rapidity of our present-day progress. One did what one had always seen before. One did not invent. One remembered. He was not an authority who had learned much, but rather he who had experienced much and therefore could remember much. In the Atlantean period, it would have been impossible for someone to decide an important matter before reaching a certain age. One had confidence only in a person who could look back upon long experience. What has been said here was not true of the initiates and their schools, for they are in advance of the stage of development of their period. For admission into such schools, the decisive factor is not age, but whether in his previous incarnations the applicant has acquired the faculties for receiving higher wisdom. The confidence placed in the initiates and their representatives during the Atlantean period was not based on the richness of their personal experience, but rather on the antiquity of their wisdom. In the case of the initiate, personality ceases to have any importance. He is totally in the service of eternal wisdom. Therefore, the characteristic features of a particular period do not apply to him. While the power to think logically was absent among the Atlanteans, especially the earlier ones, in their highly developed memory, they possessed something which gave a special character to everything they did. But with the nature of one human power, others are always connected. Memory is closer to the deeper natural basis of man than reason, and in connection with it other powers were developed, which were still closer to those of subordinate natural beings than our contemporary human powers. Thus the Atlanteans could control what one calls the life force, as today one extracts the energy of heat from coal and transforms it into motive power for our means of locomotion. The Atlanteans knew how to put the germinal energy of organisms into the service of their technology. One can form an idea of this from the following. Think of a kernel of seed grain. In this, an energy lies dormant. This energy causes the stalk to sprout from the kernel. Nature can awaken this energy that reposes in the seed. Modern man cannot do it at will. He must bury the seed in the ground and leave the awakening to the forces of nature. The Atlantean could do something else. He knew how one can change the energy of a pile of grain into technical power, just as modern man can change the heat energy of a pile of coal into such power. Plants were cultivated in the Atlantean period not merely for use as foodstuffs, but also in order to make the energies dormant in them available to commerce and industry. Just as we have mechanisms for transforming the energy, dormant in coal, into energy of motion in our locomotives, so the Atlanteans had mechanisms in which they, so to speak, burned plant seeds and in which the life force was transformed into technically utilizable power. The vehicles of the Atlanteans, which floated a short distance above the ground, were moved in this way. These vehicles traveled at a height lower than that of the mountain ranges of the Atlantean period, and they had steering mechanisms by the aid of which they could rise above these mountain ranges. One must imagine that, with the passage of time, all conditions on our earth have changed very much. 
Today, the above-mentioned vehicles of the Atlanteans would be totally useless. Their usefulness depended on the fact that then the cover of air which envelops the earth was much denser than at present. Whether in face of current scientific beliefs, one can easily imagine such greater density of air must not occupy us here. Because of their very nature, science and logical thinking can never decide what is possible or impossible. Their only function is to explain what has been ascertained by experience and observation. The above-mentioned density of air is as certain for occult experience as any fact of today given by the senses can be. Equally certain, however, is the fact, perhaps even more inexplicable for contemporary physics and chemistry, that at that time the water on the whole earth was much thinner than today. Because of this thinness, the water could be directed by the germinal energy used by the Atlanteans into technical services that today are impossible. As a result of the increased density of the water, it has become impossible to move and to direct it in such ingenious ways as once were possible. From this it must be sufficiently clear that the civilization of the Atlantean period was radically different from ours. It will also be understood that the physical nature of the Atlanteans was quite different from that of contemporary man. The Atlantean took into himself water which could be used by the life force inherent in his own body in a manner quite different from that possible in today's physical body. It was due to this that the Atlantean could consciously employ his physical powers in an entirely different way from a man of today. He had, so to speak, the means to increase the physical powers in himself when he needed them for what he was doing. In order to have an accurate conception of the Atlanteans, one must know that their ideas of fatigue and the depletion of forces were quite different from those of present-day man. An Atlantean settlement, as must be evident from everything we have described, had a character that in no way resembled that of a modern city. In such a settlement, everything was, on the contrary, still in alliance with nature. Only a vaguely similar picture is given if one should say that in the first Atlantean periods, about to the middle of the third sub-race, a settlement resembled a garden in which the houses were built of trees with artfully intertwined branches. What the work of human hands created at that time grew out of nature and man himself felt wholly related to nature. Hence his social sense also was quite different from that of today. After all, nature is common to all men. What the Atlantean built up on the basis of nature he considered to be common property, just as a man of today thinks it only natural to consider as his private property what his ingenuity, his intelligence have created for him. One familiar with the idea that the Atlanteans were equipped with such spiritual and physical powers as have been described will also understand that in still earlier times mankind presented a picture which reminds him in only a few particulars of what he is accustomed to see today. Not only men, but also the surrounding nature has changed enormously in the course of time. Plant and animal forms have become different. All of earthly nature has been subjected to transformations. Once inhabited regions of earth have been destroyed, others have come into existence. The ancestors of the Atlanteans lived in a region which has disappeared, the main part of which lay south of contemporary Asia. In theosophical writings they are called the Lemurians. After they had passed through various stages of development, the greatest part of them declined. These became stunted men, whose descendants still inhabit certain parts of the earth today as so-called savage tribes. Only a small part of Lemurian humanity was capable of further development. From this part, the Atlanteans were formed. Later, something similar again took place. The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans, who comprise present-day civilized humanity. According to the nomenclature of the science of the spirit, the Lemurians, Atlanteans, and Aryans are root races of mankind. 
If one imagines that two such root races preceded the Lemurians and that two will succeed the Aryans in the future, one obtains a total of seven. One always arises from another in the manner just indicated with respect to the Lemurians, Atlanteans, and Aryans. Each root race has physical and mental characteristics that are quite different from those of the preceding one. While, for example, the Atlanteans especially developed memory and everything connected with it, at the present time it is the task of the Aryans to develop the faculty of thought and all that belongs to it. In each root race, various stages must also be gone through. There are always seven of these. In the beginning of a period identified with a root race, its principal characteristics are in a youthful condition. Slowly, they attain maturity and finally enter a decline. The population of a root race is thereby divided into seven subraces. But one must not imagine that one subrace immediately disappears when a new one develops. Each one may maintain itself for a long time while others are developing beside it. Thus, there are always populations that show different stages of development living beside each other on Earth. The first subrace of the Atlanteans developed from a very advanced part of the Lemurians who had a high evolutionary potential. The faculty of memory appeared only in its rudiments among the Lemurians and then only in the last period of their development. One must imagine that while a Lemurian could form ideas of what he was experiencing, he could not preserve these ideas. He immediately forgot what he had represented to himself. Nevertheless, he lived in a certain civilization that, for example, he had tools, erected buildings, and so forth. This he owed not to his own powers of conception, but to a mental force in him which was instinctive. However, one must not imagine this to have been the present-day instinct of animals, but one of a different kind. Theosophical writings call the first sub-race of the Atlanteans that of the Romoahals. The memory of this race was primarily directed toward vivid sense impressions, colors which the eye had seen, sounds which the ear had heard, had a long after-effect in the soul. This was expressed in the fact that the Romoahals developed feelings that their Lemurian ancestors did not yet know. For example, the attachment to what has been experienced in the past is a part of these feelings. With the development of memory was connected that of language. As long as man did not preserve what was past, a communication of what had been experienced could not take place through the medium of language. Because in the last Lemurian period, the first beginnings of memory appeared. At that time, it was also possible for the faculty of naming what had been seen and heard to have its inception. Only men who have the faculty of recollection can make use of a name which has been given to something. The Atlantean period, therefore, is the one in which the development of language took place. With language, a bond was established between the human soul and the things outside man. He produced a speech word inside himself, and this speech word belonged to the objects of the external world. A new bond is also formed among men by communications through the medium of language. It is true that all this existed in a still youthful form among the Romoahals, but nevertheless it distinguished them profoundly from their Lemurian forefathers. The soul powers of these first Atlanteans still possessed something of the forces of nature. These men were more closely related to the beings of nature that surrounded them than were their successors. Their soul powers were more connected with forces of nature than are those of modern man. Thus the speech word that they produced had something of the power of nature, they not only named things, but in their words was a power over things and also over their fellow men. The word of the Romoahals not only had meaning, but also power. The magic power of words is something that was far truer for those men than it is for men of today. When a Romoahals man pronounced a word, this word developed a power similar to that of the object it designated. Because of this, Words at that time were curative.
They could advance the growth of plants, tame the rage of animals, and perform other similar functions. All this progressively decreased in force among the later sub-races of the Atlanteans. One could say that the original fullness of power was gradually lost. The Romoahal's men felt this plenitude of power to be a gift of mighty nature, and their relationship to the latter had a religious character. For them, language was something especially sacred. The misuse of certain sounds, which possessed an important power, was an impossibility. Each man felt that such misuse must cause him enormous harm. The good magic of such words would have changed into its opposite. That which would have brought blessings if used properly would bring ruin to the author if used criminally. In a kind of innocence of feeling, the Romoahals ascribed their power not so much to themselves as to the divine nature acting within them. This changed among the second subrace, the so-called Tlavatli peoples. The men of this race began to feel their own personal value. Ambition, a quality unknown to the Romoahals, made itself felt among them. Memory was in a sense transferred to the conception of communal life. He who could look back upon certain deeds demanded recognition of them from his fellow men. He demanded that his works be preserved in memory. Based upon this memory of deeds, a group of men who belonged together elected one as leader. A kind of regal rank developed. This recognition was even preserved beyond death. The memory, the remembrance of the ancestors or of those who had acquired merit in life, developed. From this there emerged among some tribes a kind of religious veneration of the deceased, an ancestor cult. This cult continued into much later times and took the most varied forms. Among the Romoahals, a man was still esteemed only to the degree to which he could command respect at a particular moment through his powers. If someone among them wanted recognition for what he had done in earlier days, he had to demonstrate by new deeds that he still possessed his old power. He had to recall the old works to memory by means of new ones. What had been done was not esteemed for its own sake. Only the second sub-race considered the personal character of a man to the point where it took his past life into account in the evaluation of his character. A further consequence of memory for the communal life of man was the fact that groups of men were formed which were held together by the remembrance of common deeds. Previously, the formation of groups depended wholly upon natural forces, upon common descent. Man did not add anything through his own mind to what nature had made of him. Now a powerful personality recruited a number of people for a joint undertaking, and the memory of this joint action formed a social group. This kind of social communal life became fully developed only among the third sub-race, the Toltecs. It was therefore the men of this race who first founded what can be called a community, the first method of forming a state. The leadership, the government of these communities, was transmitted from one generation to the next. The father now gave over to the son what previously survived only in the memory of contemporaries. The deeds of the ancestors were not to be forgotten by their whole line of descent. What an ancestor had done was esteemed by his descendants. However, one must realize that in those times men actually had the power to transmit their gifts to their descendants. Education, after all, was calculated to mold life through vivid images. The effectiveness of this education had its foundation in the personal power which emanated from the educator. He did not sharpen the power of thought, but in fact developed those gifts which were of a more instinctive kind. Through such a system of education, the capacities of the father were generally transmitted to the son. Under such conditions, personal experience acquired more and more importance among the third sub-race. When one group of men separated from another for the foundation of a new community, it carried along the remembrance of what it had experienced at the old scene. But at the same time, 
There was something in this remembrance which the group did not find suitable for itself, in which it did not feel at ease. Therefore, it then tried something new. Thus, conditions improved with every one of these new foundations. It was only natural that what was better was imitated. These are the facts which explain the development of those flourishing communities in the period of the third sub-race, described in theosophic literature. The personal experiences which were acquired found support from those who were initiated into the eternal laws of spiritual development. Powerful rulers themselves were initiated so that personal ability might have full support. Through his personal ability, man slowly prepares himself for initiation. He must first develop his powers from below in order that the enlightenment from above can be given to him. In this way, the initiated kings and leaders of the Atlanteans came into being. Enormous power was in their hands, and they were greatly venerated. But in this fact also lay the reason for decline and decay. The development of memory led to the preeminent power of a personality. Man wanted to count for something through his power. The greater the power became, the more he wanted to exploit it for himself. The ambition which had developed turned into marked selfishness. Thus the misuse of these powers arose. When one considers the capabilities of the Atlanteans resulting from their mastery of the life force, one will understand that this misuse inevitably had enormous consequences. A broader power over nature could be put at the service of personal egotism. This was accomplished in full measure by the fourth sub-race, the primal Turanians. The members of this race who were instructed in the mastery of the above-mentioned powers often used them in order to satisfy their selfish wishes and desires. But used in such a manner, these powers destroy each other in their reciprocal effects. It is as if the feet were stubbornly to carry a man forward while the torso wanted to go backward. Such a destructive effect could only be halted through the development of a higher faculty in man. This was the faculty of thought. Logical thinking has a restraining effect on selfish personal wishes. The origin of logical thinking must be sought among the fifth sub-race, the primal Semites. Men began to go beyond a mere remembrance of the past and to compare different experiences. The faculty of judgment developed. Wishes and appetites were regulated in accordance with this faculty of judgment. One began to calculate, to combine. One learned to work with thoughts. If previously one had abandoned oneself to every desire, now one first asked whether thought could approve this desire, while the men of the fourth sub-race rushed wildly toward the satisfaction of their appetites, those of the fifth began to listen to an inner voice. This inner voice checks the appetites, although it cannot destroy the claims of the selfish personality. Thus the fifth sub-race transferred the impulses for action to within the human being. Man wishes to come to terms within himself as to what he must or must not do. But what thus was one within, with respect to the faculty of thought, was lost with respect to the control of external natural forces. With this combining thought mentioned above, one can master only the forces of the mineral world, not the life force. The fifth sub-race therefore developed thought at the expense of control of the life force. But it was just through this that it produced the germ of the further development of mankind. New personality, self-love, even complete selfishness could grow freely, for thought alone which works wholly within and can no longer give direct orders to nature is not capable of producing such devastating effects as the previously misused powers. From this fifth sub-race, the most gifted part was selected which survived the decline of the fourth root race and formed the germ of the fifth, the Aryan race, whose mission is the complete development of the thinking faculty. The men of the sixth sub-race, the Akkadians, developed the faculty of thought even further than the fifth. They differed from the so-called primal Semites in that they employed this faculty in a more comprehensive sense than the former. 
It has been said that while the development of the faculty of thought prevented the claims of the selfish personality from having the same devastating effects as among the earlier races, these claims were not destroyed by it. The primal Semites at first arranged their personal circumstances as their faculty of thought directed. Intelligence took the place of mere appetites and desires. The conditions of life changed. If preceding races were inclined to acknowledge as leader one whose deeds had impressed themselves deeply upon their memory, or who could look back upon a life of rich memories, this role was now conferred upon the intelligent. If previously that which lived in a clear remembrance was decisive, one now regarded as best what was most convincing to thought. Under the influence of memory, one formerly held fast to a thing until one found it to be inadequate, and in that case it was quite natural that he who was in a position to remedy a want could introduce an innovation. But as a result of the faculty of thought, a fondness for innovations and changes developed. Each wanted to put into effect what his intelligence suggested to him. Turbulent conditions, therefore, began to prevail under the fifth subrace, and in the sixth they led to a feeling of the need to bring the obdurate thinking of the individual under general laws. The splendor of the communities of the third subrace was based on the fact that common memories brought about order and harmony. In the sixth, this order had to be brought about by thought-out laws. Thus, it is in this sixth sub-race that one must look for the origin of regulations of justice and law. During the third sub-race, the separation of a group of men took place only when they were forced out of their community, so to speak because they no longer felt at ease in the conditions prevailing as a result of memory. In the sixth, this was considerably different. The calculating faculty of thought sought the new as such. It spurred men to enterprises and new foundations. The Acadians were therefore an enterprising people with an inclination to colonization. It was commerce, especially, that nourished the waxing faculty of thought and judgment. Among the seventh sub-race, the Mongols, the faculty of thought was also developed, but characteristics of the earlier sub-races, especially of the fourth, remained present in them to a much higher degree than in the fifth and sixth. They remained faithful to the feeling for memory, and thus they reached the conviction that what is oldest is also what is most sensible and can best defend itself against the faculty of thought. It is true that they also lost the mastery over the life forces, but what developed in them as the thinking faculty also possessed something of the natural might of this life force. Indeed, they had lost the power over life, but they never lost their direct, naive faith in it. This force had become their god, on whose behalf they did everything they considered right. Thus they appeared to the neighboring peoples as if possessed by this secret force, and they surrendered themselves to it in blind trust. Their descendants in Asia and in some parts of Europe manifested, and still manifest, much of this quality. The faculty of thought planted in men could only attain its full value in relation to human development when it received a new impetus in the fifth root race. The fourth root race, after all, could only put this faculty at the service of that to which it was educated through the gift of memory. The fifth alone reached life conditions for which the proper tool is the ability to think. 4. Transition of the fourth into the fifth root race. In this chapter we shall learn about the transition of the fourth, the Atlantean root race, into the fifth, the Aryan to which contemporary civilized mankind belongs. Only he will understand it aright who can steep himself in the idea of development to its full extent and meaning. Everything which man perceives around him is in process of development. In this sense, the use of thought, which is characteristic of the men of our fifth root race, had first to develop. It is this root race in particular that slowly and gradually brings the faculty of thought to maturity. In his thought, man decides upon something, 
and then executes it as the consequence of his own thought. This ability was only in preparation among the Atlanteans. It was not their own thoughts, but those which flowed into them from entities of a higher kind that influenced their will. Thus, in a manner of speaking, their will was directed from outside. The one who familiarizes himself with the thought of this development of the human being and learns to admit that man, as earthly man, was a being of a quite different kind in prehistory, will also be able to rise to a conception of the totally different entities that are spoken of here. The development to be described required enormously long periods of time. What has previously been said about the fourth root race, the Atlanteans, refers to the great bulk of mankind, but they followed leaders whose abilities towered far above theirs. The wisdom these leaders possessed and the powers at their command were not to be attained by any earthly education. They had been imparted to them by higher beings which did not belong directly to earth. Therefore, it was only natural that the great mass of men felt their leaders to be beings of a higher kind, to be messengers of the gods. For what these leaders knew and could do would not have been attainable by human sense organs and by human reason. They were venerated as divine messengers, and men received their orders, their commandments, and also their instruction. It was by beings of this kind that mankind was instructed in the sciences, in the arts, and in the making of tools. Such divine messengers either directed the communities themselves or instructed men who were sufficiently advanced in the art of government. It was said of these leaders that they communicate with the gods and were initiated by the gods themselves into the laws according to which mankind had to develop. This was true. In places about which the average people knew nothing, this initiation this communication with the gods actually took place. These places of initiation were called temples of the mysteries. From them, the human race was directed. What took place in the temples of the mysteries was therefore incomprehensible to the people. Equally, little did the latter understand the intentions of their great leaders. After all, the people could grasp with their senses only what happened directly upon earth not what was revealed from higher worlds for the welfare of earth. Therefore, the teachings of the leaders had to be expressed in a form unlike communications about earthly events. The language the gods spoke with their messengers in the mysteries was not earthly, and neither were the shapes in which these gods revealed themselves. The higher spirits appeared to their messengers in fiery clouds in order to tell them how they were to lead men. Only man can appear in human form. Entities whose capacities tower above the human must reveal themselves in shapes which are not to be found on earth. Because they themselves were the most perfect among their human brothers, the divine messengers could receive these revelations. In earlier stages, they had already gone through what the majority of men still had to experience. They belonged among their fellow humans only in a certain respect. They could assume human form, but their spiritual mental qualities were of a superhuman kind. Thus they were divine human hybrid beings. One can also describe them as higher spirits who assumed human bodies in order to help mankind forward on their earthly path. The real home of these beings was not on earth. These divine human beings led men without being able to inform them of the principles by which they directed them. For until the fifth subrace of the Atlanteans, the primal Semites, men had absolutely no capacities for understanding these principles. The faculty of thought which developed in this subrace was such a capacity, but this evolved slowly and gradually. Even the last sub-races of the Atlanteans could understand very little of the principles of their divine leaders. They began, at first quite imperfectly, to have a presentiment of such principles. Therefore, their thoughts and also the laws that we have mentioned among their governmental institutions were guessed at rather than clearly thought out. 
The principal leader of the fifth Atlantean subrace gradually prepared it so that in later times, after the decline of the Atlantean way of life, it could begin a new one that was to be wholly directed by the faculty of thought. One must realize that at the end of the Atlantean period, there existed three groups of man-like beings. One, the above-mentioned divine messengers, who in their development were far ahead of the great mass of the people, and who taught divine wisdom and accomplished divine deeds. Two, the great mass of humanity, among which the faculty of thought was in a dull condition, although they possessed natural abilities which modern men have lost. 3. A small group of those who were developing the faculty of thought, while they gradually lost the natural abilities of the Atlanteans through this process, they were advancing to the stage where they could grasp the principles of the divine messengers with their thoughts. The second group of human beings was doomed to gradual extinction. The third, however, could be trained by a being of the first kind to take its direction into its own hands. From this third group, the above-mentioned principal leader, whom occult literature designates as Manu, selected the ablest in order to cause a new humanity to emerge from them. These most capable ones existed in the fifth subrace. The faculty of thought of the sixth and seventh subraces had already gone astray in a certain sense and was not fit for further development. The best qualities of the best had to be developed. This was accomplished by the leader through the isolation of the selected ones in a certain place on earth, in inner Asia, where they were freed from any influence of those who remained behind or of those who had gone astray. The task which the leader imposed upon himself was to bring his followers to the point where, in their own souls, with their own faculties of thought, they could grasp the principles according to which they had hitherto been directed in a way vaguely sensed, but not clearly recognized by them. Men were to recognize the divine forces which they had unconsciously followed. Hitherto the gods had led men through their messengers. Now men were to know about these divine entities. They were to learn to consider themselves as the implementing organs of divine providence. The isolated group thus faced an important decision. The divine leader was in their midst, in human form. From such divine messengers, men had previously received instructions and orders as to what they were or were not to do. Human beings had been instructed in the sciences that dealt with what they could perceive through the senses. Men had vaguely sensed a divine control of the world, had felt it in their own actions, but they had not known anything of it clearly. Now their leader spoke to them in a completely new way. He taught them that invisible powers directed what confronted them visibly, and that they themselves were servants of these invisible powers that they had to fulfill the laws of these invisible powers with their thoughts. Men heard of the supernatural divine. They heard that the invisible spiritual was the creator and preserver of the visible physical. Hitherto, they had looked up to their visible divine messengers to the superhuman initiates, and through the latter was communicated what was and was not to be done but now they were considered worthy of having the divine messenger speak to them of the gods themselves. Mighty were the words which again and again he impressed upon his followers. Until now you have seen those who led you, but there are higher leaders whom you do not see. It is these leaders to whom you are subject. You shall carry out the orders of the god whom you do not see, and you shall obey one of whom you can make no image to yourselves. Thus did the new and highest commandment come from the mouth of the great leader, prescribing the veneration of a god whom no sensory visible image could resemble, and therefore of whom none was to be made. Of this great fundamental commandment of the fifth human root race, the well-known commandment that follows is an echo. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 31. The principal leader, Manu, was assisted by other divine messengers who executed his intentions for particular branches of life and worked on the development of the new race. For it was a matter of arranging all of life according to the new conception of a divine administration of the world. Everywhere the thoughts of men were to be directed from the visible to the invisible. Life is determined by the forces of nature. The course of human life depends on day and night, on winter and summer, on sunshine and rain. How these influential visible events are connected with the invisible, divine powers, and how man was to behave in order to arrange his life in accordance with these invisible powers was shown to him. All knowledge and all labor was to be pursued in this sense. In the course of the stars and of the weather, man was to see divine decrees, the emanation of divine wisdom. Astronomy and meteorology were taught with this idea. Man was to arrange his labor, his moral life in such a way that they would correspond to the wise laws of the divine. Life was ordered according to divine commandments, just as the divine thoughts were explored in the course of the stars and in the changes of the weather. Man was to bring his works into harmony with the dispensations of the gods through sacrificial acts. It was the intention of Manu to direct everything in human life toward the higher worlds. All human activities, all institutions were to bear a religious character. Through this, Manu wanted to initiate the real task imposed upon the fifth root race. This race was to learn to direct itself by its own thoughts, but such a self-determination can only lead to good if man also places himself at the service of the higher powers. Man should use his faculty of thought, but this faculty of thought should be sanctified by being devoted to the divine. One can only understand completely what happened at that time if one knows that the development of the faculty of thought, beginning with the fifth sub-race of the Atlanteans, also entailed something else. From a certain quarter, men had come into possession of knowledge and of arts, which were not immediately connected with what the above-mentioned Manu had to consider as his true task. This knowledge and these arts were at first devoid of religious character. They came to man in such a way that he could think of nothing other than to place them at the service of self-interest, of his personal needs. To such knowledge belongs, for example, that of the use of fire in human activities. In the first Atlantean times, man did not use fire since the life force was available for his service. But with the passage of time, he was less and less in a position to make use of this force. Hence, he had to learn to make tools, utensils from so-called lifeless objects. He employed fire for this purpose. Similar conditions prevailed with respect to other natural forces. Thus, man learned to make use of such natural forces without being conscious of their divine origin. So it was meant to be. Man was not to be forced by anything to relate these things that served his faculty of thought to the divine order of the world. Rather, was he to do this voluntarily in his thoughts? It was the intention of Manu to bring men to the point where, independently, out of an inner need, they brought such things into a relation with the higher order of the world. Men could choose whether they wanted to use the insight they had attained purely in a spirit of personal self-interest or in the religious service of a higher world. If man was previously forced to consider himself as a link in the divine government of the world, by which, for example, the domination over the life force was given to him without his having to use the faculty of thought, he could now employ the natural forces without directing his thoughts to the divine. Not all the men whom Manu had gathered around him were equal to this decision, but only a few of them. It was from this few that Manu could really form the germ of the new race. He retired with them in order to develop them further, 
while the others mingled with the rest of mankind. From this small number of men who finally gathered around Manu, everything is descended, which up to the present forms the true germs of progress of the fifth root race. For this reason also, two characteristics run through the entire development of this fifth root race. One of the characteristics is peculiar to those men who are animated by higher ideas, who regard themselves as children of a divine universal power. The other belongs to those who put everything at the service of personal interests, of egotism. The small following remained gathered around Manu until it was sufficiently fortified to act in the new spirit, and until its members could go out to bring this new spirit to the rest of mankind, which remained from the earlier races. It is natural that this new spirit assumed a different character among the various peoples, according to how they themselves had developed in different fields. The old remaining characteristics blended with what the messengers of Manu carried to the various parts of the world. Thus a variety of new cultures and civilizations came into being. The ablest personalities from the circle around Manu were selected for a gradual, direct initiation into his divine wisdom so that they could become the teachers of the others. A new kind of initiate thus was added to the old divine messengers. It consisted of those who had developed their faculty of thought in an earthly manner, just as their fellow men had done. The earlier divine messengers, and also Manu, had not done this. Their development belonged to higher worlds. They introduced their higher wisdom into earthly conditions. What they gave to mankind was a gift from above. Before the middle of the Atlantean period, men had not reached the point where by their own powers they could grasp what the divine decrees were. Now, at the time indicated, they were to attain this point. Earthly thinking was to elevate itself to the concept of the divine. The human initiates united themselves with the divine. This represents an important revolution in the development of the human race. The first Atlanteans did not as yet have a choice as to whether or not they would consider their leaders to be divine messengers. For what the latter accomplished imposed itself as the deed of higher worlds. It bore the stamp of a divine origin. Thus the messengers of the Atlantean period were entities sanctified by their power, surrounded by the splendor that this power conferred upon them. From an external point of view, the human initiates of later times are men among men, but they remain in relation with the higher worlds, and the revelations and manifestations of the divine messengers come to them. Only exceptionally, when a higher necessity arises, do they make use of certain powers that are conferred upon them from above. Then they accomplish deeds which men cannot explain by the laws they know and which therefore they rightly regard as miracles. But in all this, the higher intention is to put mankind on its own feet, fully to develop its faculty of thought. Today the human initiates are the mediators between the people and the higher powers and only initiation can make one capable of communication with the divine messengers. The human initiates, the sacred teachers, became leaders of the rest of mankind in the beginning of the fifth root race. The great priest kings of prehistory, who are not spoken of in history, but rather in the world of legend, belong among these initiates. The higher divine messengers retired from the earth more and more, and left the leadership to these human initiates, whom, however, they assisted in word and deed. Were this not so, man would never attain free use of his faculty of thought. The world is under divine direction, but man is not to be forced to admit this. He is to realize and to understand it by free reflection. When he reaches this point, the initiates will gradually divulge their secrets to him. But this cannot happen all at once. The whole development of the fifth root race is a slow road to this goal. At first, Manu himself led his following like children. 
Then the leadership was gradually transferred to the human initiates. Today, progress still consists in a mixture of the conscious and unconscious acting and thinking of men. Only at the end of the fifth root race, when throughout the sixth and seventh sub-races a sufficiently great number of men are capable of knowledge, will the greatest among the initiates be able to reveal himself to them openly. Then this human initiate will be able to assume the principal leadership just as Manu did at the end of the fourth root race. Thus the education of the fifth root race consists in this, that a greater part of humanity will become able freely to follow a human Manu as the germinal race of this fifth root race followed the divine one. 5. The Lemurian Race A passage from the Akasha Chronicle referring to a very distant prehistoric period in the development of mankind, will be set forth in this chapter. This period precedes the one depicted in the descriptions given above. We are here concerned with the third human root race, of which it is said in theosophical books that it inhabited the Lemurian continent. According to these books, this continent was situated south of Asia, and extended approximately from Ceylon to Madagascar. What is today Southern Asia and parts of Africa also belong to it. While all possible care has been taken in the deciphering of the Akasha Chronicle, it must be emphasized that nowhere is a dogmatic character to be claimed for these communications. If, to begin with, the reading of things and events so remote from the present is not easy, the translation of what has been seen and deciphered into the language of today presents almost insuperable obstacles. Dates will be given later. They will be better understood when the whole Lemurian period and also the period of our fifth root race up to the present have been discussed. The things which are communicated here are surprising, even for the occultist who reads them for the first time, although the word surprising is not quite exact. Therefore, he should only communicate them after the most careful examination. The fourth, the Atlantean root race was preceded by the so-called Lemurian. During its development, events of the very greatest importance occurred with respect to the earth and to men. Here, however, something will first be said of the character of this root race after these events and only then will the latter be discussed. By and large, memory was not yet developed among this race. While men could have ideas of things and events, these ideas did not remain in the memory. Therefore, they did not yet have a language in the true sense. Rather, what they could utter were natural sounds which expressed their sensations, pleasure, joy, pain, and so forth but which did not designate external objects. But their ideas had a quite different strength from those of later men. Through this strength, they acted upon their environment. Other men, animals, plants, and even lifeless objects could feel this action and could be influenced purely by ideas. Thus, the Lemurian could communicate with his fellow men without needing a language. This communication consisted in a kind of thought reading. The Lemurian derived the strength of his ideas directly from the objects that surrounded him. It flowed to him from the energy of growth of plants, from the life force of animals. In this manner, he understood plants and animals in their inner action and life. He even understood the physical and chemical forces of lifeless objects in the same way. When he built something, he did not first have to calculate the load limit of a tree trunk, the weight of a stone. He could see how much the tree trunk could bear, where the stone in view of its weight would fit, where it would not. Thus the Lemurian built without engineering knowledge on the basis of his faculty of imagination, which acted with the sureness of a kind of instinct. Moreover, to a great extent, he had power over his own body. When it was necessary, he could increase the strength of his arm by a simple effort of the will. For example, he could lift enormous loads merely by using his will. If later the Atlantean was helped by his control of the life force, 
the Lemurian was helped by his mastery of the will. He was, the expression should not be misinterpreted, a born magician in all fields of lower human activities. The goal of the Lemurians was the development of the will, of the faculty of imagination. The education of children was wholly directed toward this. The boys were hardened in the strongest manner. They had to learn to undergo dangers, to overcome pain, to accomplish daring deeds. Those who could not bear tortures, who could not undergo dangers, were not regarded as useful members of mankind. They were left to perish under these exertions. What the Akasha Chronicle shows with respect to this raising of children surpasses everything contemporary man can picture to himself in his boldest imaginings. The bearing of heat, even of a searing fire, the piercing of the body with pointed objects were quite common procedures. The raising of girls was different. While the female child was also hardened, everything else was directed toward her developing a strong imagination. For example, she was exposed to the storm in order calmly to feel its dreadful beauty. She had to witness the combats of the men fearlessly, filled only with a feeling of appreciation of the strength and power she saw before her. Thereby, propensities for dreaming and for fantasy developed in the girl, and these were highly valued. Because no memory existed, these propensities could not degenerate. The dream or fantasy conceptions in question lasted only as long as there was a corresponding external cause. Thus they had a real basis in external things. They did not lose themselves in bottomless depths. It was, so to speak, nature's own fantasy and dreaming which were put into the female soul. The Lemurians did not have dwellings in our sense, except in their latest times. They lived where nature gave them the opportunity to do so. The caves which they used were only altered and extended in so far as necessary. Later they built such caves themselves, and at that time they developed great skill for such constructions. One must not imagine, however, that they did not also execute more artful constructions. But these did not serve as dwellings. In the earliest times, they originated in the desire to give to the things of nature a man-made form. Hills were remodeled in such a way that the form afforded man joy and pleasure. Stones were put together for the same purpose, or in order to be used for certain activities. The places where the children were hardened were surrounded with walls of this kind. Toward the end of this period, the buildings which served for the cultivation of divine wisdom and divine art became more and more imposing and ornate. These institutions differed in every respect from what temples were later for they were educational and scientific institutions at the same time. He who was found fit was here initiated into the science of the universal laws and into the handling of them. If the Lemurian was a born magician, this talent was here developed into art and insight. Only those could be admitted who, through all kinds of discipline, had acquired the ability to overcome themselves to the greatest extent. For all others, what went on in these institutions was the deepest secret. Here, one learned to know and to control the forces of nature through direct contemplation of them. But the learning was such that in man the forces of nature changed into forces of the will. He himself could thereby execute what nature accomplishes, what later mankind accomplished by reflection, by calculation, at that time had the character of an instinctive activity. But here, one must not use the word instinct in the same sense in which one is accustomed to apply it to the animal world. For the activities of Lemurian humanity towered high above everything the animal world can produce through instinct. They even stood far above what mankind has since acquired in the way of arts and sciences through memory reason, and imagination. If one were to use an expression for these institutions which would facilitate an understanding of them, 
one could call them colleges of willpower and of the clairvoyant power of the imagination. From them emerged the men who, in every respect, became rulers of the others. Today, it is difficult to give in words a true conception of all these conditions, for everything on earth has changed since that time. Nature itself and all human life were different. Therefore, human labor and the relationship of man to man differed greatly from what is customary today. The air was much thicker even than in later Atlantean times, the water much thinner. And what forms the firm crust of our earth today was not yet as hard as it later became. The world of plants and animals had developed only as far as the amphibians, the birds, and the lower mammals and as far as vegetable growths which resemble our palms and similar trees. However, all forms were different from what they are today. What now exists only in small forms was then developed to gigantic sizes. At that time, our small ferns were trees and formed mighty forests. The modern higher mammals did not exist. On the other hand, a great part of humanity was on such a low stage of development that one cannot but designate it as animal. What has been described here was true only of a small part of mankind. The rest lived their life in animalism. In their external appearance and in their way of life, these animal men were quite different from the small group. They were not especially different from the lower mammals, which resembled them in form in certain respects. A few more words must be said about the significance of the above-mentioned temple localities. What was cultivated there was not really religion. It was divine wisdom and art. Man felt that what was given to him there was a direct gift from the spiritual universal forces. When he received this gift, he considered himself a servant of these universal forces. He felt himself sanctified from everything unspiritual. If one wishes to speak of religion at this stage of the development of mankind, one could call it religion of the will. The religious temper and dedication lay in the fact that man guarded the powers granted to him as a strict, divine secret, and that he led a life through which he sanctified his power. Persons who had such powers were regarded by others with great awe and veneration, and this awe and veneration were not called forth by laws or something similar, but by the immediate power which these persons exercised. The uninitiated, of course, stood under the magical influence of the initiated. It was also natural that the latter considered themselves to be sanctified personages, for in their temples they participated in direct contemplation of the active forces of nature. They looked into the creative workshop of nature. They experienced a communion with the beings which build the world itself. One can call this communication an association with the gods. What later developed as initiation, as mystery, emerged from this original manner of communication of men with gods. In subsequent times, this communication had to become different, since the human imagination, the human spirit, took other forms. Of special importance is something which occurred in the course of Lemurian development by virtue of the fact that the women lived in the manner described above. They thereby developed special human powers. Their faculty of imagination was in alliance with nature became the basis for a higher development of the life of ideas. They took the forces of nature into themselves, where they had an after-effect in the soul. Thus the germs of memory were formed. With memory was also born the capacity to form the first and simplest moral concepts. The development of the will among the male element at first knew nothing of this. The man followed instinctively either the impulses of nature or the influences emanating from the initiated. It was from the manner of life of the women that the first ideas of good and evil arose. There one began to love some of the things which had made a special impression on the imagination, 
and to abhor others. While the control which the male element exercised was directed more toward the external action of the powers of the will, toward the manipulation of the forces of nature, beside it in the female element there developed an action through the soul, through the inner personal forces of man. The development of mankind can only be correctly understood by the one who takes into consideration that the first progress in the life of the imagination was made by women. The development connected with the life of the imagination, with the formation of memory, of customs which form the seeds for a life of law, for a kind of morals, came from this side. If man had seen and exercised the forces of nature, woman became the first interpreter of them. It was a special new manner of living through reflection which developed here. This manner had something much more personal than that of the men. One must imagine this manner of the women to have been also a kind of clairvoyance, although it differed from the magic of the will of the men. In her soul, woman was accessible to another kind of spiritual powers. The latter spoke more to the feeling element of the soul, less to the spiritual to which man was subject. Thus there emanated from men an effect which was more natural divine, from women one which was more soul divine. The development which woman went through during the Lemurian period had the result that at the appearance of the next, the Atlantean root race on earth, an important role devolved upon her. This appearance took place under the influence of highly developed entities who were familiar with the laws of the formation of races and capable of guiding the existing forces of human nature into such paths that a new race could come into being. These beings will be specially mentioned further on. May it suffice for the moment to say that they possessed superhuman wisdom and power. They now isolated a small group out of Lemurian mankind and designated these to be the ancestors of the coming Atlantean race. The place where they did this was situated in the tropical zone. Under their direction, the men of this group had been trained in the control of the natural forces. They were very strong and knew how to win the most diverse treasures from the earth. They could cultivate the fields and use their fruits for their subsistence. They had become characters of strong will through the discipline to which they had been subjected. Their souls and hearts were developed only in small measure. On the other hand, these had been developed among the women. Memory and fantasy and everything connected with them were to be found among the latter. The above-mentioned leaders caused the group to divide itself into smaller groups. They put the women in charge of ordering and establishing these groups. Through her memory, woman acquired the capacity to make the experiences and adventures of the past useful for the future. What had proved helpful yesterday she used today and realized that it would also be useful tomorrow. The institutions for communal life therefore emanated from her. Under her influence, the concepts of good and evil developed. Through her thoughtful life, she had acquired an understanding for nature. Out of the observation of nature, those ideas developed in her according to which she directed the actions of men. The leaders had arranged things in such a way that through the soul of woman, the willful nature, the vigorous strength of man were ennobled and refined. Of course, one must represent all this to oneself as childish beginnings. The words of our language all too easily call up ideas which are taken from the life of the present. By way of the awakened soul life of the women, the leaders first developed the soul life of the men. In the colony we have described, the influence of the women was therefore very great. One had to go to them for advice when one wanted to interpret the signs of nature. The whole manner of their soul life, however, was still dominated by the hidden human soul forces. One does not describe the matter quite exactly, but fairly closely, if one speaks of a somnambulistic contemplating among these women. In certain higher dreams, the secrets of nature were divulged to them, 
and they received the impulses for their actions. Everything was animated for them and showed itself to them in soul powers and apparitions. They abandoned themselves to the mysterious weaving of their soul forces. That which impelled them to their actions were inner voices or what plants, animals, stones, wind, and clouds, the whispering of the trees, and so on, told them. From this state of soul originated that which one can call human religion. The spiritual in nature and in human life gradually came to be venerated and worshipped. Some women attained a special preeminence because out of special mysterious depths they could interpret what the world contained. Thus it could come to pass among such women that that which lived within them could transpose itself into a kind of natural language, for the beginning of language lies in something which is similar to song. The energy of thought was transformed into audible sound. The inner rhythm of nature sounded from the lips of wise women. One gathered around such women, and in their song-like sentences felt the utterances of higher powers. Human worship of the gods began with such things. For that period, there can be no question of sense in that which was spoken. Sound, tone, and rhythm were perceived. One did not imagine anything along with these, but absorbed in the soul the power of what was heard. The whole process was under the direction of the higher leaders. They had inspired the wise priestesses with tones and rhythms in a manner which cannot now be further discussed. Thus, they could have an ennobling effect on the souls of men. One can say that in this way, the true life of the soul first awakened. In this realm, beautiful scenes are shown by the Akasha Chronicle. One of these will be described. We are in a forest near a mighty tree. The sun has just risen in the east. The palm-like tree, from around which the other trees have been removed, casts mighty shadows. The priestess, her face turned to the east, ecstatic, sits on a seat made of rare natural objects and plants. Slowly, in rhythmical sequence, a few strange, constantly repeated sounds stream from her lips. A number of men and women are sitting in circles around her, their faces lost in dreams, absorbing inner life from what they hear. Other scenes too can be seen. At a similarly arranged place, a priestess sings in a similar manner, but her tones have in them something mightier, more powerful. Those around her move in rhythmic dances, for this was the other way in which the soul entered into mankind. The mysterious rhythms which one had heard from nature were imitated by the movements of the limbs. One thereby felt at one with nature, and with the powers acting in her. The place on earth in which this stock of a coming race of men was developed was especially suited for this purpose. It was one where the then still turbulent earth had become fairly calm, for Lemuria was turbulent. After all, the earth at that time did not yet have its later density. The thin ground was everywhere undermined by volcanic forces, which broke forth in smaller or larger streams. Mighty volcanoes existed almost everywhere and developed a continuous destructive activity. Men were accustomed to reckoning with this fiery activity in everything they did. They also used this fire in their labors and contrivances. Their occupations were often such that the fire of nature served as a basis for them in the same way as artificial fire does in human labor today. It was through the activity of this volcanic fire that the destruction of the Lemurian land came about. While the part of Lemuria from which the parent race of the Atlanteans was to develop had a hot climate, 
It was, by and large, free of volcanic activity. Human nature could unfold more calmly and peacefully here than in the other regions of the earth. The more nomadic life of former times was abandoned, and fixed settlements became more and more numerous. One must represent to oneself that at that time the human body still had very malleable and pliant qualities. This body still changed form whenever the inner life changed. Not long before, men had still been quite diverse as regards their external form. At that time, the external influence of region and climate were still decisive in respect to their form. Only in the colony described did the body of man increasingly become an expression of his inner soul life. Moreover, this colony had an advanced, externally more nobly formed race of men. One must say that through the things which they had done, the leaders had really first created what is the true human form. This occurred quite slowly and gradually. It happened in such a way that the soul life of man was first developed and that the still soft and malleable body adapted itself to this. It is a law in the development of mankind that as progress continues, man has less and less of a molding influence on his physical body. This physical human body, in fact, received a fairly unchanging form only with the development of the faculty of reason and with the hardening of the rock, mineral, and metal formations of earth connected with this development. For in the Lemurian, and even in the Atlantean period, stones and metals were much softer than later. This is not contradicted by the fact that there exist descendants of the last Lemurians and Atlanteans who today exhibit forms as fixed as the human races which were formed later. These remnants had to adapt themselves to the changed environmental conditions of Earth, and thus became more rigid. Just this is the reason for their decline. They did not transform themselves from within. Instead, their less developed interior was forced into rigidity from the outside and thus compelled to stagnation. This stagnation is really a regression, for the inner life too has degenerated because it could not fulfill itself within the rigid external bodily structure animal life was subject to even greater changeability. We shall speak further about the animal species existing at the time of the development of man and about their origin, as well as about the development of new animal forms after man already existed. Here we shall say only that the existing animal species continually transformed themselves and that new ones were developing. This transformation was, of course, a gradual one. The reasons for the transformation lay in part in a change of habitat and of the manner of life. The animals had a capacity of extraordinarily rapid adaptation to new conditions. The malleable body changed its organs comparatively rapidly, so that after a more or less brief period, the descendants of a particular animal species resembled their ancestors only slightly. The same was the case in even greater measure for the plants. The greatest influence on the transformation of men and animals was exercised by man himself. This was true whether he instinctively brought organisms into such an environment that they assumed certain forms, or whether he achieved this by experiments in breeding. The transforming influence of man on nature was immeasurably great at that time, compared with the conditions of today. This was especially the case in the colony we have described, for there the leaders directed this transformation in a way of which men were not conscious. This was the case to such a degree that when men left the colony in order to found the different Atlantean races, they could take with them a highly developed knowledge of the breeding of animals and plants. The labor of cultivation in Atlantis was then essentially a consequence of the knowledge thus brought along. 
But here again it must be emphasized that this knowledge had an instinctive character. In this state, essentially, it remained among the first Atlantean races. The preeminence of the feminine soul, which has been described, was especially strong in the last Lemurian period and continued into the Atlantean times, during which the fourth subrace was preparing itself. But one must not imagine that this was the case among all of mankind. It was true, however, for that part of the population of Earth from which the truly advanced races later emerged. This influence exercised the strongest effect upon all that which in man is unconscious. The development of certain constant gestures, the refinements of sensory perception, the feeling for beauty, a good part of the general life of sensations and feelings which is common to all men. All this originally emanated from the spiritual influence of woman. It is not an overstatement if one interprets the reports of the Akasha Chronicle in such a way as to affirm the civilized nations have a bodily form and expression as well as certain bases of physical soul life which were imprinted upon them by woman. In the next chapter, we shall go back to earlier periods of the development of mankind, during which the population of Earth still belonged to only one sex. The development of the two sexes will then be described.